So good evening, everyone. It's really nice to have you here. We're really excited to, uh, to have our second meetup about AI today. Um, so please, just two things. If you need to use, uh, if you need to ask questions, please use this makeshift microphone. That's really nice. And also don't hesitate to scan the QR code that's on the TV right next to my colleague so that you can be informed about our upcoming meetups. Uh, without further ado, we're going to let the floor to uh, César from a proxy lab, CTO at Proxy Labs, and he's going to discuss LLM Ops. Yeah, another Ops, indeed. Thank you, Marco. Hello, guys. Thank you. So my name is Cesar like the salad. I like to use this punchline, I will say. And today I will speak about a little bit of AI at the scale and what is LLM Ops and the challenge, for sure, that are related to. So brief, this is the agenda. So who we are, I will just short introduce who we are at Prophecy Labs. And then yet another ops. So we do need another operation. We have GitOps, we have MLOps, we have fine tech ops, etc. So a quick start just to introduce the subject. And then I will try to convince you why this is important. It's not like it's, it's not like simple, but I can summarize this to expectations. And that is, let's say, the whole point of this, let's say, the why. And then let's go to the how. How is that put in place? What are the fundamentals? What are the processes? Probably the technologies or the, um, the tools in both these large language model operations. And finally, for sure, the don't forget, which are two main topics, is the ethics and security of all these applications based on LLMs. So let's start on that so first uh, prophecy labs so we are at we are at AI, ai boutique based at brussels so essentially we are kind of i'm um, around 15 skilled ai experts on different let's say topics from data engineering machine learning data science we produce custom solutions in ai but not only we are as well specialized in cloud solutions and as well that engineering, and we try to, let's say, provide to our customers an holistic approach. And we have like nice offices at Tura Taxi here in Brussels. So our offerings, essentially, we start and we believe that the clients needs first an a strategy in terms of data and AI that is important, and we can help this, our clients to elevate on to know why they need AI for sure. Expertise on demand, my colleagues actually can, can do a lot of nice stuff. And as well, projects, end to end projects, that is the time frame projects that we propose to our clients. So, without further, let's say, introductions, let's start with what is large language model. So, yet another ops. We do need another ops. So, we have already DevOps, MLOps, Triceratops and LMOPs, these large language model operations. And essentially, is just a set of practice to manage in an efficient manner these large language models in production environments. Okay, and why we need these large language models? Because now they are embedded on applications, on software, etc. Okay, so the goal actually is to make robust high performance and as well secure applications based on large language models as the core, let's say, technology. And you may think about, because probably MLOps is more, let's say, known in the industry. So what is the difference between LMOps and MLOps is essentially that the model itself on LLMOPs is a large language models, and that actually comes with certain complexities like high computational costs uh, and as well other kinds of things like, for instance, in some of the cases, in some of the applications, the model is facing the user, is in first contact with the user, which is important, right? So this is a typical architecture. So we have data processing, we have the training of the model, we have how we face the user, but I, we really need this, and that is the question. And 
that is something that is nerd. I really like to build these kind of systems. If I can do it, I will do it, but that's, that is not the important part. We need that for other reasons, because of, I mean, other reasons unrelated to the complexity itself. And I will try to, in the next slide, to convince you why that is important, why is all this fuss about these operations to maintain your LLM, which is the core of your applications that is facing the user at last. So the why. So that is why I wanted to introduce a little bit what, the what, but now is the why. Why is that important? And it's about expectations. And first, I, I would like to start with what I call the point of no return, ChatGPT. As you know, for years, we have used we have using like, like um, I don't know a lot of ML based applications like recommendation system from Spotify for instance. You are aware of that. You have used that without probably not notice or probably yes. Machine translation is using AI, image detection, audio detection, etc. So we have used a lot of these over the past years. But for me, actually, a lot of change, a lot of this change actually in. November 30, 2022, when ChatGPT comes into the um, scene, okay, and there were my there were major there were let's say three major changes. The first is like now the user is directly in contact with the generative model. Before the model was kind of we try to hide the AI within the application. Now you are as a user, I mean in direct contact with the model itself, so you are interacting with the model. The second thing is like, I mean, as I said, the model is the, now the protagonist, the main player of your applications. And the third is like the massive reach. I remember that when I was, I think it was two weeks after uh, the release of ChatGPT, that I was in my barber, and my barber, barber was cutting my hair, and he was actually speaking about, yeah, how you hear about this AI model that, I mean, is doing cool stuff. So this massive, massive reach, and because it was as well a free tool and open to the masses, to the public in general. So that was a game changer. And a lot of people were convinced that these kind of technologies are of good use for sure. And you can base a lot of software or applications on these large language models. So, but expectations have to be managed, right? And there is something that I call the mirage trap of a POC. And uh, let's face it, proof of concepts using LMs are super nice, amazing. You can actually craft, like real quick, a proof of concept that, let's say, a classic application will be a kind of AI copilot that will answer on your corpus, in cor corpus of text in your company. And when you receive answers that actually resonates with you, that is a kind of good thing, and you can actually be impressed of that. Uh, and OpenAI, AWS, Bedrock, Vertex AI have actually made a tremendous job to hide this complexity of managing all these large language models for you and only using an, let's say, API call, few cents, and using certain, let's say, software practices, you can have like a nice POC. But the problem is like this nice POC can, can somehow actually be a functional assistant, can work perfectly, can be quickly crafted, and business want to rush to production. And that is when the problem comes. If you don't know actually what is the expectations of the final product, and you are based your, let's say, your ideas on this POC, a lot of problems will, will happen. Okay, and manage expectations is crucial, and I will present next how, from the point of view of user experience and user interface, how we can fix things here, okay? So as I said, the bar is too high. ChatGPT is just an amazing tool. You can do amazing stuff from there, but works well, but works well only in certain scenarios, in the nicest scenarios. In the, let's say, less likely scenarios, it's difficult to test. And let's face it, in the POC, you're not testing the unlikely scenarios. You are testing, let's say, the easy cases, okay? Users, clients, ones, LMs based applications, scalable, precise, trustworthy, just like ChatGPT, but on my company, for my text, from my knowledge base, I will say. And pods are just great, right? But there are cru crucial questions that we can answer just by thinking on the final product from the user perspective, like what is the latency? 
what is the data that this LM has access to regarding to my client. And all these actually questions can clarify a little bit or can define what will be the LLM practice that we have to implement to reach this goal. But we have to see through, I will say, this POC at the first place. So that is something that we craft in the company, which is the LLM, LLM up, so LLM up expectation bill. Okay, so we have to ask different questions. The first is the scope, because one problem of these LLMs is like, you can tame it. You can just try to direct what would you like to be inside your software, let's say application, but is the scope well-defined? You, you, you can just, let's say, say to LLM, just behave like this. There is no escape, let's say. For instance, a uh, classic scope will be an information retrieval system, like a rack. Second thing is the latency expected. That is important because these, believe it or not, are computationally costly. ChatGPT is just hiding this computation because, as you know, as the, I think the previous presentation in this meetup, LMs are just computing the next word. And you can trick a little bit this kind of latency, just streaming the words as you produce the whole text. But in general, the text produced can take 30 seconds, one minute, but you just get distracted by the first word. And then it's like a progress bar. Number of users as well is a crucial because you have to think if your system will just be scalable. You are using just a service, you are hosting your own model. Security is very important because we have to protect, I suppose that you are as well aware of these prong injection techniques, which is analogous to what we used to call back in the day, SQL injection. So to try to just trick these LMs. Ethical considerations that you have to take in, into, into account and depending if your, and that actually is related to the first point, as well as the scope, the purpose is this LM application designed to your colleagues, internal to your organization or is facing the public which is two different, let's say, um, risk to consider. And the final is something that is often overlooked is the data ingestion. Is they, this data changing every day? Because normally in text, we have massive quantities of data to process, even before, let's say, expecting having some results using the model. So you may ask, what could go wrong, right? So the POC is nice, we just release it, we, we just rush to the production, but you will be surprised. And there is a lot of, let's say, cases out of the internet that people just rush to the, to the production without thinking the consequence and facing clients. This first actually is a, is a case of Air Canada that actually is misleading information. The chatbot in the portal, in this portal, give a misleading information to a client and then Air Canada was forced by a court to pay the customer because there was a mistake. So they have to take responsibility on, there, on that. And I think that our canola just removed the chatbot from the website for security reasons. Other cases is like the free chat GPT of Chevrolet Watsonville case. So they just rush, they put a chat, GPT, uh, chat based on chat GPT directly. And then with just a few prompt techniques or not even a prompt technique, just chat GPT there, you can actually solve differential equations here and you don't need to pay $20 per month to get ChatGPT. And one of the most famous cases in which expectations were not managed, that is the Galactica case. So probably you have never heard about that. But Galactica was a LLM produced only two weeks before ChatGPT was released. It was, it's a good model. It was trained on scientific papers. It's not the corpus of the internet that is very wild. It's just really well created data but they don't manage the expectations in the, sense that, in the sense that this LLM was for the purpose of doing science. And they kind of put the marketing in the following sense. They said to the sci scientists, use this model that will help you to write papers, write equations, and you will not what? You, you will not what? It's like a lot of scientists, highly specialized people on different domains start to test that and for sure hallucinates. But this model back in the day, in my opinion, was better than ChatGPT was, GPT 3.5. But this model only lasts three days and then was taken out by Meta, for sure, of the website. So that is, let's say, expectations not managed well, or bad marketing. 
So somehow we think that is important, but let's as well dive into the how. So what is the fundamentals of or pillars of large language model operations? So please interrupt me if you have any questions so far. So I will divide this in four main pillars. The first is, yes. Well, um, so I, I was thinking about the, the wheel of expectations that you showed earlier, and I was wondering if you're talking about that as something applicable to all AI-based applications, whether for internal, uh, for the consumer, or if it was specifically for, um, if I understand well, um, the um, chat GPT like tools that companies can use internally when they don't want their employees yeah. uh, to use chat GPT. Yes. Ideal is both. Both. You have to get, let's say, use it and as well in classic software, let's say, applications. But in the case of this kind of copilots, the only problem is like you are kind of connecting this model directly or almost directly to the user. So it's difficult to control, let's say, the way of this model is generating or providing information. So that is why, depending of, let's say, how is the risk, you have to apply in different degrees these kind of expectations that you are, let's say, defining. Okay, okay, yes. So you specifically designed it to apply to co-pilots, but it can work for any... It can work for anything. Okay. It's like depending gotcha. of... For instance, in other cases, imagine that you are doing like a semantic similarity or comparing text. So in that case, if you or your model make a mistake and the comparison of the, or the, let's say, the more close text or articles to a given article are not like, let's say, very accurate, there is no, let's say, too many risks, right? It's not like generating information. You are just showing certain comparisons. So it depends what is the output and what is the user expecting. But when you are having a copilot, you are just kind of generating or providing information. That is in the case of having a kind of assistant just informative. But in other cases, you have assistants that can take actions or can do things for you. And that could be as well even dangerous if you don't have a human in the loop or a person that kind of validate or control this kind of application. So I would say it depends, but yeah, it will be mo most applicable to general AI. Of course, if you're giving advice, it's always still going to depend on the situation. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome. So um, as I said first, we have the data processes and engineering. That is, we're talking about here big data, text, massive, large quantities of text. And this is often overlooked uh, in most of the cases because it's most of the basic uh, practices in data engineering. The second thing is the model development and adaptation. I call it adaptation because I don't want to, let's say, define now whether you have to fine tune or to adapt or contextualize your model. So there is different choices. You can use the model as it is, or you can fine tune, but that is depend on your, depending on your business. In either choice, actually, you need to, let's say, completely shift your LLM apps practices. Deployment and scalability. So you have to plan for your users and the use that your final product application is, is let's say, um, used in the market, I would say. And finally, monitoring and maintenance. You have to keep an eye how this application is behaving. And sometimes this kind of, let's say, it will work, but it will fail silently, like hallucinations. You see that ChatGPT is working, it's giving answers, but the answers are not, let's say, quite accurate. So let's start with data processing. So here we have the most overlooked part, in my opinion, on this kind of application, because we have big corpus of text to be processed, contextualized. And actually, this corpus of text can be used to either contextualize, that is in the case of RACs, which, is, which stands for Retrieval Augmented Generative. Um, it's a kind of information retrieval system. Or if you have to fine tune, that is another process that actually needs more work or more expertise to have, that I will address later. Often, you will face that a lot of these texts are not in the correct format. There are a bunch of PDF in your company. You see a lot of words, presentations, emails, HTML, 
pages that you need to clean. And that is a process that takes time and that you have to craft. And depending on the complexity, you have to just scale up this, this processing. And for sure, probably you will need to store this into big databases. And let's face it, probably you will, you will store in relational databases. So SQL is still used, even if it's some old school. SQL is, the, is still your friend, even if you're using like modern uh, data processor. And also we use LLMs or small LLMs to clean text because sometimes cleaning the text is very ambiguous. So where you remove a comma, where you split the sentence to be processed. So you need probably a, a smaller LLMs to clean the text uh, to then get used in large language models afterwards. So there is a process that needs to be crafted and depending if your data is changing every day frequently or is fixed, you need to just process all this in batch. And probably you need, a, as I said, a small model to just support your cleaning process of text, feeding your large models. That is your main application. So at the end is the basics, is the classic ETL process, extract, transform, and load. Another pillar will be for sure the model development and adaptation. Here you have to choose the model. So you have many choices, but I will, I will say, to split these choices on proprietary models. So you use it as a service, you call an API and you pay a fee, or open source models that you have to install it, maintain it, scale it, install it in a cluster. So you have to hear choice wisely. And there is, a, let's say, a, a slide next in which we can make a decision about which, let's say, model to choose, because that will be completely different in the implementation. Adaptation. I would like to not define first, I mean, define what is adaptation in terms of first contextualizing. What I mean for that is like you are using the model as it is. You are not, let's say, training, fine tuning. And the second part is fine tuning. Fine tuning is computationally costly. It's not the same as using the LLM as it is. And the most tricky part is like you need data. You need like curated and clean data that have to be probably produced by your organizations, by people just annotating by hand because you need high quality data to feed or to fine tune the model. But that is, I would say, just advisable for certain business processes that are really important in which, I don't know, a classic foundational model like GPT or Claude cannot manage, I would say. Uh, let's say in the case of contextualizing, for sure, you can use a lot of pro engineering techniques to plus a vector database that is essentially just a database of numerical representations of text to get the job done. Like, like in the case of a rack, retrieval of mental generative is like a, um, a search engine with the, with the user experience of a chatbot to retrieve information. But in the case of fine tuning, as I said, there is a, a different methods to try to just optimize this fine tuning. But for me, you have two main costs. First is the cost of computing power that you need to fine tune the model. And the second is the human cost that you need to collect the data at the first place that is relevant enough to train your model if you need it. And finally, as well, you need vector database because essentially computers don't understand text. These are transferred into numbers, into vectors, array of numbers and representations that you can actually make mathematical operations and can support, let's say, your LLMs in some sense. But going back to the question, use a service or host your own model? And I would say it depends. It depends on a lot of things for the first. So there is a nice table that I take for that source. And depends on, for instance, if you need more privacy, your data is, let's say, important somehow, and you cannot actually get it out from your organization. So uh, probably choose uh, to host your LLM. If you need just quick deployment, like a POC, as we actually state on the Mirage, it's amazing, OpenAI or any other provider can give you a nice, let's say, API to use the model as it is with nice latency. Low cost, I would say it depends. If you have few users, go to an API service, and if you don't need to train, for sure. But depend on your daily, let's say, average user, uh, usage uh, in the day. 
if you don't want to mess up with the infrastructure, with putting the machines, with the, let's say, scalability, okay, it's a better choice to use a, um, an API. But if you have or you want full control of the code, non external dependencies, like a high availability service, probably is better to go to uh, to self-hosted your model. But that implicates that you have to need a, you need a team, you need all the infrastructure, probably you have to go to the cloud, to a provider. So I would say that depends on the choice and that has to be solved for sure. Uh, even at your product level, you have to decide when you create the product before going to the production. Because if you, let's say, are doing a POC with the OpenAI API, works very well, but then you realize that the data that you would put in the model cannot be, let's say, outsourced or put in there. I mean, you have to switch and you have to do a lot of work because you have created the wrong expectations to the business that that can be possible, but then the data cannot be just shipped to the, in that case, OpenAI service. And then in terms of cost, because money is important, at the end of the day, you want to monetize this application. So depending on your users, you have two cores here, two, two functions. OpenAI or any provider can give you what will be the cost per call or per number of tokens, and that is a linear function. Could be PSYs depending on how much you use. But uh, as you see here, it's self-hosted. Initially, it's a high cost, but if you have a lot of users and you have a lot of, let's say, quorum of uh, either internal or external, probably the uh, best way or a good way to do is going into the direction of self-hosted. But remember that is not only here infrastructure, you need to have the team as well to manage that. That is a, a cost that probably, have, I mean, have to be, in, let's say, put it into account there in the red card. So I would say that is an important consideration in which you have to think about it in terms of what to use, because that is the main, let's say, um, model application object that you are using on your um, product. Deploying and scaling relates to the things that I said. Um, previously, you need to understand the needs of your users, the acceptable latency nowadays on the internet, five seconds in a web page, you are dead. People will just go back and will never visit your application. So. Yeah, you need to understand what is the latency expected by your user and that I will give you the idea on how to scale uh, your, your machines to meet that expectations. In the case of, the, of using an, open, uh, of an API of a provider, you just have to trust the provider that they will give you this latency expected that you have to test for sure. And, uh, and that actually is strongly dependable of the model chosen and as well if you are doing fine tuning or just contextualization. Um, hosting options, as I said, you have to, as we discussed previously, to balance between using a service and then don't worry about all the infrastructure that you have to put in place or uh, host your own model and have to build a team and grow the expertise on your organization to put that in place. And as well, you have to think on another other pattern, which is deployment patterns. In the case of the main product, for sure, probably you will have a live system that will be an API that you will produce, even if it's either, either calling another API in the case of a service or calling your own model that is hosted. But as well, you can have any processes that run in batches that you can make some economies there. And you have as well batch processing. For instance, processing all the documents of the previous day on your organization. So that could, could be done in batch processing. It will be less costly for sure and will run during the night and a certain period. So that is another pattern that you should, or people should think about it in terms of how often the data is, is changing. And the last one is addressing scalability. So you have to plan for, okay, what happens if, if, if I have a lot of users using my application in a certain moment, okay? or my system is overloaded. Should I scale automatically? Should I just put more machines and therefore more money into the applications just to maintain the service? Or what happens is if there is certain abuse on my system, should I just cut 
because I could eventually go up and just spending money in my in the number of machines that are used to support my model there. And finally, monitoring. Monitoring is important because you have to know how your system first is, con is well consumed. Let's say you have to monitor first your machine. That is purely IT. Uh, so is your infrastructure well, well used? Is there, is there any abuse of your system that you have to check? Um, and that is something that is very important. Models can fail silently. Sometimes actually these models is still working. It's giving you response, is functional but it's slightly probably drifting because probably the text that was based on was not longer let's say applicable to the today's world or you are having hallucinations on certain things that you didn't test before so my advice is like user feedback is the key for sure you can have it as a proxy to see as well if your model in production is behaving well and as I said, there is too many choices, a lot of vendors in all this ecosystem. We have the people that provide the models, people that host the models, the data annotation, the vector database, everything actually that have to, you have to have a choice for sure on what you are willing to host. And as I said, all depends on the stakes that you are putting in your product. If it's uh, something that is for your organization, probably you can do it quickly with an API, with a service, but if it's something facing the public with certain consequence, you have to, let's say, evaluate the risk and plan accordingly, and either can be relatively easy to set in place or can be hard, for sure, depending on, on what you're facing. And then the don't forget, for sure, the last part of my presentation is ethics and security is something that is very important that they will discuss briefly. So first is the ethics is non-negotiable foundation, in my opinion. So that should be based in practice of fairness, transparency. You should be able to explain why your model do this or do that. And as well, minimizing harm. Because sometimes, as you know, these models are trained on the corpus of text of the internet. And internet can be wild. And you have to either train or um, try to control accordingly. Uh, you can put different, let's say, protection layers, and doesn't have doesn't have to be, let's say, inside your LLM. It can be all the protection layers. Like for instance, you can detect some harmful content generation in the output, but it's tricky when you want to, let's say, balance the the latency because you have to wait that all the generation of text first appears, then to check it, uh, and that will be other output. Or you can as well control the input. So if a certain user is giving like a bad input, you can just control it and try to just avoid hitting your main, let's say, application. And that can be with a small, let's say, model that you train accordingly, just so, just like a, a firewall protection. Okay. Um, eventually, you can incorporate ethical rules. That is in the case that you are doing the retraining or fine tuning. For sure, in certain cases, like foundational models like GPT-4, they have already a lot of things on it that actually is really well trained in this kind of harmful or ethical rules. But on other models like open source, internet is, internet is wild. You have everything there and can hallucinate or can do certain things that are not correct. Okay, and my last advice is test, test and test for sure. That can happen to the big players like Meta, like Google, that can happen to you. Uh, for sure, so we have to be sure that, and as I said, depends on the expectations. And finally, security is something that is important. If you skip it, you will see, you will face the consequence that uh, probably we never realize until that happened. So classic IT security that have to be put in there, API protection, <laughs> caching, API gateways, all the, let's say, boring things that are important and that are applicable for sure but have to be there, otherwise it's just open. Uh, we can do extra care with kind of a certain prone design to avoid prone injection, but not only at user level, because the user can, let's say, kind of trick your application, but can be as well an ingestion level. If you don't care, I mean, if you didn't take care of what you are ingesting in the documents, you can have some, let's say, 
phrases in the documents that you're ingesting in your system that will actually um, lead to different behaviors on your application and that can be that can be dangerous as well so you need some practice in data audit to try to mitigate that and data exposure exposure and segregation for sure you have to use the minimal data as possible for your application uh, try to remove uh, let's say the, the personal data or anonymize, validate, audit your process. Um, it's like an example. Imagine that you want to make a, a system that give you, I don't know, like advice about HR to your company. So this, imagine that you fit all the documents on HR, but you, I don't know, give all the salaries of the employees. So like this, actually, this chatbot have the access to that without not noticing, and then. Some certain people can just ask about that. So that could be, let's say, a seed example, but that could happen. So you have to just try to segregate information what is accessible to these kind of applications. And as well, one, one thing that is important that can save you a lot is like know your audience. If these kind of applications are for your coworkers, colleagues, is internal to your organization, it's more secure because you expect that these persons, your colleagues, will not abuse on the system. But, in, but for the general public, you have clients, you have other people that can use your, your application and you have to be, let's say, kind of safeguard and secure about that. So as I said, really depends on what is your final target audience in that case. And to just finalize, so what you, you get from all of this, and that is my, my, let's say, my conclusions. The first thing is like in contrast to classic software development, LMs are more unpredictable, more difficult to tame. Okay, you cannot be sure. You have to just make different practices to try to just combat or control these kind of applications. Managing expectations is crucial from the user and a stakeholder perspective because let's face it, as I said, POCs are really amazing. They can actually be like resemble to the final product, but the devil, the devil is hidden in the details. So you can have some cases that can be just borderline. And well-designed user experience and as well knowing your targeted audience can help to first set expectations and then size the practices that you need in your LMOps system. So my opinion, that is why I think that LMOps or these kind of operations are important for the product itself. And that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thanks. Thanks for the talk, Caesar. Um, I have a question uh, for companies planning on yeah, making a decision, basically internal API or whatever, uh, how do you advise them to make a decision now when everything's changing? So basically you're, it's a lock-in. So you lock you, yourself in for wh however long. How do you advise for that? Yeah. No, I think like what we advise to, to the different clients is first to invest in the strategy because strategy is kind of agnostic. Invest in the strategy on to which direction you want to move your company in terms of that technologies, but because as you said, technologies are changing. And depending on the stakes or how you want to use AI, either on your internal operations or as a part of your product, probably if you are using that as a part of your product, you have to build a team eventually. You have to know this kind of technologies. If you want to use that as a part of your process, probably you can, I don't know, buy uh, external products to be the use. I will say it depends, but as initial strategy is, is the best approach because it's less risky. You a little bit kind of cover all the bases and then you can take an informed decision about in which, let's say, you want to invest. If you are going for the internal, let's say, product development, probably you need to invest in a team and there is people involved, a lengthy process. Uh, yeah, that could take a couple of years to just start producing something. Thanks. And maybe a follow-up question. How do you keep up with the big guns who have huge teams? And if you make it yourself, how can you keep up? I think it's the, I will say that it's in the customization. 
because the big, let's say, organization is like, a, is, <laughs> there was a phrase that some guy put in LinkedIn, like every time that OpenAI is making a feature, it's just blasting like uh, 100 AI startups. So for sure, depends on what deep you can go in the application, but as well, if you know your, your client, if you know your business and you can customize that, you have a competitive advantage over, let's say, uh, big company doing just generic copilot, right? So depending on knowing your business and, and the customization on that regard. Thanks. Um, this might be a silly question, um, but so there are a lot of different applications for uh, AI at companies. We talked about uh, a co-pilot for their employees or uh, applications for their consumers. If a company was to create uh, their own model internally, does that then also help them create completely different applications years later if they want to do it for their consumers or is it two completely separate things no in theory they can but you have to have a lot of investment and creating the model itself because one thing is practicing lmaps it's like using models that organization produce or universities in the case of open source other thing is like create your own lm from scratch that actually is millions of dollars that you have to invest and for companies like IBM, it's worth it, or Databricks, or Microsoft, right? But for other companies that are medium-sized, probably the best is to use this model or try to fine-tune if you have the capacity, or use it as it is, or even go further, use it as a service. Uh, but that actually could give you, if you put the right investment, and it's your direction, could, be, could give you a certain competitive advantage in that particular niche sector that you are trying to develop a product. Okay, thanks. No I think your questions? explanation was very clear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no. Yes. And that cut. I oh, know that will not yet. <laughs> Well, thank you very much again, okay. Cesar. Uh, it was really nice to have you here. I suggest we uh, keep on discussing around a few drinks and some food. And uh, see you around. Indeed. Thanks. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.